This is Much Ado Books at the village of Alfriston, East Sussex, about eight miles away from where we now live. This time last year, it held a sale of the library of the late distinguished Labour politician, Dennis Healy, who, with his wife Edna, had lived nearby for 40 years in a house with views of the Cookmere Valley to the sea and within a short distance of Monk's house, home of Virginia Woolf, one of Healy's most beloved modern writers. Recalling his wartime service in Italy, Healy wrote in his memoir, My Secret Planet, Once north of Rome, I was able to find second-hand British books. In a little bookshop near the Arno in Florence, I made a wonderful haul of first editions of Yeats, Lawrence and Virginia Woolf from the library of a lady called Leolin Louise Everett. God bless her, whoever she was. It was the last thing I could ever have expected when I first joined up. One of the books he bought, for just two shillings, was Woolf's Kew Gardens, illustrated by Virginia's sister, Vanessa Bell, and published by the Hogarth Press, which was founded exactly a century ago by Virginia and Leonard Woolf at their then home in Richmond, with a view of the trees at Kew and the Great Pagoda. Healy gave it as a present to his mother, and I bought it all these years later, one spring morning at Much Ado. The original owner of the book, Leolin Louise Everett, well, I should add, by the way, that the book is a limited edition of 500. Leolin Louise Everett was, I discovered, or Kathleen did, an American poet. She and her composer husband lived much of their lives in the Villa Razzolini in Florence. Seen here in Vasari's fresco of the 1530 siege of Florence. By a remarkable stroke of fate, Kathleen again, I have since acquired one of their original wood engraved book plates, sending Christmas greetings from the Villa Razzolini. In 1927. From the oval shaped flower bed, there rose perhaps a hundred stalks spreading into heart shaped or tongue shaped leaves halfway up and unfurling at the tip red or blue or yellow petals marked with spots of colour raised upon the surface. And from the red, blue or yellow gloom of the throat emerged a straight bar, rough with gold dust and slightly clubbed at the end. The petals were voluminous enough to be stirred by the summer breeze, and when they moved, the red, blue and yellow lights passed one over the other, staining an inch of the brown earth beneath with a spot of the most intricate colour. The light fell either upon the smooth grey back of a pebble or the shell of a snail with its brown circular veins, or, falling into a raindrop, it expanded with such intensity of red, blue and yellow the thin walls of water that one expected them to burst and disappear. Her own press gave Virginia Woolf a certain amount of enviable freedom from publishers and provided a form of therapy, a manual respite from the strain of writing and from the voices in her head. She was already a keen amateur bookbinder and wrote to her sister, Vanessa, it's a most absorbing occupation. One has great blocks of type which have to be divided into their fonts and then put into the right partitions. The work of ages, especially when one confuses the N's and the H's as I did yesterday. We get so absorbed we can't stop. I can see that the real printing 
will absorb one's entire life. Virginia handset the type of the first British book edition of Eliot's The Wasteland, and therefore acted as midwife to one of the seminal works of British modernism. But she did not publish another seminal modernist work, James Joyce's Ulysses. After reading the first four chapters, uh, she wrote, I don't know that he's got anything very interesting to say. The Hogarth Press survives today, but is now an imprint of the Crown Publishing of the Random House Conglomerate. The hand press the Wolfs proudly took delivery of in April 1917 was a 19th century Cropper Minerva Platon Press, now residing in the Elizabethan Tower at Sissinghurst. And now, from the last page. Voices. Yes, voices, wordless voices, breaking the silence suddenly with such depth of contentment, such passion of desire, or, in the voices of children, such freshness of surprise, breaking the silence. But there was no silence. All the time, the motor omnibuses were turning their wheels and changing their gear, like a vast nest of Chinese boxes, all of wrought steel, turning ceaselessly, one within another, the city murmured, on the top of which the voices cried aloud, and the petals of myriads of flowers flashed their colours into the air. A plane didn't go over. But as well as all that traffic, it's on the flight path, Kew Gardens, to Heathrow. But it remains um, a blessed plot. <laughs> I remember putting my penny, or tuppence or sixpence, it increased, but it was still coppers, into a turnstile slot to get in. Now there is um, an austere box office which has expanded, of course, and has a staff and a bookshop and whatnot. And it costs pounds. Mind you, this only cost two shillings. Battered as it was by the Arno, it's been beautifully restored. But I paid a great deal more than two shillings. Could have got into Kew Gardens several times over. Mm -hmm.